All right, so uh, let's talk about some systematic ways of constructing variational integrators. Uh, and in particular, there are these uh, what are called Galerkin methods. And the basic idea, if you will, behind a Galerkin method uh, of variational integrators is that you, p, um, you look at the um, <coughs> variational characterization of uh, the exact discrete Lagrangian, and you uh, approximate this by uh, replacing the integral with some quadrature rule and replacing the uh, space of twice differentiable curves with um, some choice of finite dimensional function space. So, uh, if you will, this comes from uh, the fact that uh, <coughs> your exact discrete Lagrangian. L D exact Q0, Q1, H, right, uh, can be characterized in the following way. Uh, it's the extremum over some curve Q in the space of, say, twice differentiable curves uh, from some interval from 0 to H to the configuration <coughs> space Q, uh, which satisfies boundary conditions. So Q at 0 is Q0 and then q at h is q1, and then you extremize over the action integral associated with this uh, curve, okay? So 0 to h of l, q uh, tau, q dot tau, d tau, okay? And it's easy to convince yourself that this is equivalent uh, to uh, the kind of characterization which we have, um, which is in terms of evaluating the action integral on the solution of the all Lagrange boundary value problem, uh, because the stationarity condition for this extremal problem is exactly the all Lagrange equations. Okay, so you can uh, evaluate that like that extremal uh, by just evaluating the action integral on a solution of the all Lagrange boundary value problem, which is perhaps the more familiar. Um, characterization of uh, Jacobi solution at the Hamilton Jacobi equation. All right, so anyway, with, with that in mind, then uh, that gives you then a very systematic way of constructing computable approximations of the exact discrete Lagrangian, uh, again, by replacing uh, the integral with some quadrature rule, some quadrature approximation, and replacing this infinite dimensional family of twice differentiable curves with some. Uh, finite dimensional family, uh, for example, uh, polynomials up to some fixed degree. Okay, so, um, right, okay, so what you do is you, um, so you want to choose um, a finite dimensional Uh, approximation space let's call that CS okay um, and uh, it's contained um, in this space of uh, curves um, well, maybe the C2 notation is uh, misleading here. So here I meant twice differentiable curves, right? Um, so um, let's just call that um, C0HQ, all right? Okay, all right. So, so this is the finite dimensional subspace of that, if you will. Okay, uh, and in particular, this thing is maybe the set of Q in uh, this uh, sort of infinite dimensional family of curves, okay, with the property that Q is a polynomial <coughs> of degree S. Uh, so in principle, one could, of course, consider other finite dimensional subspaces, uh, maybe those generated by a different set of basis functions, but, but this is certainly one possibility. Okay, and then, uh, as I said, you replace the uh, integral by some sort of quadrature approximation, right? And then you choose 
a quadrature rule. Okay, um, and so what happens is that you replace that integral. So say the integral from zero to h of uh, L Q tau Q dot tau D tau. Okay, I'm going to approximate it by, um, okay, h times the sum from i equals one to s of bi times the integrand evaluated at a bunch of quadrature points. So q at say ci h and then q dot at ci h. Okay, and then uh, here ci is uh, in the interval from zero to one. Right, are uh, the quadrature points. And then the BI are uh, the quadrature weights. Okay, so if you do that, then you can construct a computable discrete Lagrangian uh, by <coughs> replacing again, it's like this family, this infinite dimension family of curves um, and, and this integral um, with the approximations. Okay, so then uh, we have, so given again, this finite dimensional approximation space and quadrature rule, right, uh, we can consider a Galerkin discrete Lagrangian. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> as this object, LD Q0, Q1, again implicitly depending on H, is just the extremum over Q in this uh, finite dimensional. Uh, approximation space, CS. Uh, uh, and again, satisfying the boundary conditions. Um, um, all right, so maybe I should say that um, here the boundary conditions I already sort of put into this. Um, so, so maybe I should write it in the following way. Okay, okay, C is this. Um, where C zero H Q, right, is the space of trajectories uh, Q from the interval zero to H to uh, the configuration space Q with the boundary conditions that Q at zero is Q zero and Q at H is Q one. Okay, all right, so, all right, so I'm going to put basically the boundary conditions into the definition of this function space. Uh, and then, so the condition that um, CS is, uh, you know, it's like a subset, if you will, it's like of this C configuration space uh, still includes the boundary conditions, okay? So so now I can just say Q is uh, being extremized over, it's like this space of polynomials of up to degree S, um, which uh, again, satisfy the boundary conditions. Okay. And, uh, and then you replace the action integral by this uh, quadrature approximation, which is H uh, sum from I equals one to S of BI L evaluated at Q, uh, C I H Q dot C I H. Okay, so that's what we call uh, a Galerkin discrete Lagrangian. And then the advantage, of course, of a Galerkin discrete Lagrangian is that this is something which you could actually compute, uh, whereas this in general is uh, much harder to compute because it's an um, you can't always evaluate the integral exactly, uh, and then you're extremizing over an infinite dimensional space. Okay, so that's in general, not computable, uh, whereas this one is. Okay. Um, 
So, so how do you uh, make this uh, more explicit, right? Uh, so one way to make this more explicit, uh, especially if you have polynomials, right, is to um, parameterize, it's like the space of polynomials with uh, a bunch of, um, in some sense, control points, if you will. Okay, um, so let's see how you do that. Okay, so I'm just going to erase most of this. Just leaving the definition of the Galerkin discrete Lagrangian at the bottom. Okay, so so really what I'm trying to do, if you will, is to um, parameterize this uh, finite dimensional function space, uh, and then that will allow us to actually work with this, right? Um, because if you can more or less write this as some um, combination, it's like of you know. Um, basis functions, right, then you can take uh, variations over the, um, over the control weights, if you will. Okay, so, uh, so the way I do this is I choose uh, control points. Um, so let's, so I, um, I specify Q0 and Q1, so I have to uh, have control points at uh, 0 and 1, okay? So d0 uh, is 0, and then I have this uh, increasing uh, sort of set of points, um, eventually up to ds, and ds has to be 1, again, because I'm specifying both q0 and q1, which correspond to the initial and the final time. So I choose these control, maybe control times is a better way of thinking about it, I choose these control times uh, and control points. Um, so the control points are, uh, as you might expect, the value of that uh, polynomial at the control times. Okay, so the control points will be uh, Q0, 0, is Q0, right, and then you have Q0, 1, all the way up to Q0, S, and Q0, S is, of course, Q1, okay? So the picture to keep in mind, then, is you have some curve Q of T, right? You have um, the interval, which goes from 0 to um, 1, okay? And then, um, all right, and then you have these... Uh, D values, right? So this is D1, this is DS minus 1, and then the, the point here is Q0, 0, Q0, 1, uh, Q0, S minus 1, and then Q0, S, which is of course Q1, and this is Q0. Right, so that's more or less, it's like the picture to keep in mind. Um, and then, um, in practice, of course, it's like what you really want to do is you need to rescale this interval from 0 to 1 to 0 to h. Uh, so really, the, the, the maybe the right picture to keep in mind is 0, d1, h, ds minus 1, h, and then h here, right? So, uh, so that's really uh, the picture which then corresponds to what this q is. Okay, anyhow, so you have control times and you have control points. Uh, and, and of course, uh, you know that if you have a polynomial of degree s, it has in general uh, s plus one uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, and so if you specify, um, if you have uh, s plus one distinct points and you know what the values of the polynomial are at those s plus one distinct points, uh, then you've uniquely specified this polynomial degree s, okay? Uh, and then of those s plus 1 degrees of freedom, it's like two of them are prescribed, which are sort of the end values, q0 and q1. And so you have only a remainder of s minus 1 degrees of freedom, it's like which parameterize uh, this space, okay? Uh, and so the idea then is that you allow yourself to vary, it's like those uh, control points uh, in the interior, uh, and that's going to allow you to then write down uh, the stationarity conditions for this uh, Galerkian discrete Lagrangian. Okay, so so there is so there exists uh, some QD, right? Um, 
which um, is in this, uh, you know, finite dimensional subspace. Right, and uh, satisfying, if you will, Okay, and I should think of the QD as in some sense being parameterized like by the control values um, and, uh, and the time step, right? Okay, so um, anyway, um, okay, so, so this anyway has the property that QD, it's like at uh, one of these internal stages, oh, sorry, uh, control times, right? Say D, um, okay. Okay, so uh, so you evaluate it's like uh, QD at one of the control times, and that's equal to uh, the control point value. Okay, Q zero. Okay, and this is true from uh, zero to S. Okay, uh, and then we can consider a Lagrange polynomial associated with these control times. So you consider a Lagrange polynomial. Okay, L tilde, right, um, associated with uh, these control times. Okay. All right. Um, So, so one thing it's like you have to be careful about is that uh, this Lagrange polynomial is associated to control times, which again are normalized from the interval uh, for the interval zero to one, right? And then there is uh, this uh, change of variables, if you will, to the interval zero to h. Okay, uh, so so you have to be a little bit careful, um, and the reason, of course, you want to um, have the Lagrange polynomials is like be defined in terms of this normalized control times uh, is because then you have a fixed expression for what that Lagrange polynomial is independent of the time step h, right? So, uh, um, and so that sort of saves you a little bit, but then you have to worry about uh, those scaling factors <coughs> coming from um, the, uh, the Jacobian basically associated with the change of variables. Okay, um, but that's not such a big problem. Okay, um, so um, so what that means is that uh, when you have QD, it's like and you write this in terms of the Lagrange polynomials. What has to happen is that QD uh, has to be evaluated at tau times h, right? So the there's the scaling done here, and then this is going to be equal to uh, the sum from uh, nu equals one to zero to s of q zero nu, okay, l tilde, okay, and then there's a tau, right? So again, it's like you have to be careful, right? The tau is some sense the dimensionless uh, quantity, which is normalized in the interval zero to one, and then this is going to correspond to um, QD evaluated at tau times h, right, which is sort of consistent with this picture we have here. <coughs> All right, so anyhow, um, so that's QD, and then what you want to do is you want to write down the stationarity conditions for this thing uh, to be stationary. Um, and you want to vary over the control points which you have control over, which are the interior ones, uh, Q01 to Q0S, okay? So, uh, so you take variations um, in Q0 nu for nu equals to one to S. <coughs> Okay, uh, so I have to differentiate this. So that means that uh, you want that to be stationary. So zero is equal to 
the derivative of this thing uh, where uh, the Q is, is given by this uh, linear combination uh, and you're taking variations respect to Q zero nu. Okay, so this is H uh, sum from I equals one to S. Okay, of BI, and then I have to differentiate uh, this uh, by the chain rule. So L depends on both Q and Q dot. So there's a DL DQ term first. Okay, uh, and then uh, I'm going to suppress. <coughs> you know, it's like where this is being evaluated. I'm just going to write this as CIH, uh, and you should understand this to mean that I'm evaluating QD at CIH and Q dot uh, D at CIH. Okay. And then I have to differentiate uh, Q uh, with respect to the control values, okay? So, um, so that's just going to be uh, this um, Lagrange polynomial, L tilde nu uh, S at CI. Okay, so that's one term. Okay, and then there is uh, the DL, the Q dot term, uh, again, evaluated at CIH. Uh, and then I have to differentiate uh, the derivative of this uh, respect to the time. Uh, and then now what's gonna happen is that there is this change of variables you have to worry about. Uh, and the net effect of that is that there's gonna be a, a factor of one over H, which drops out of this uh, from the Jacobian associated that change of variables. So there's a one over H here. Okay, because I'm going to have to differentiate this respect to time, uh, this equation respect to time, and then I have to differentiate with respect to uh, Q zero nu. Okay, uh, so that's uh, L tilde dot, okay, nu S C I. Okay, all right. And then this is true, for, uh, you want this to be true for nu equals to one to S minus one. Okay, all right. So, uh, so we're getting there. I'm just gonna leave this here um, and uh, sort of keep working. All right, so I'm just gonna leave this here for reference uh, and keep going with this discussion. All right, um, so uh, as, as you know, uh, if you have a discrete Lagrangian, uh, then the um, symplectic map is uh, written implicitly in the following way. So the symplectic map from say Q0, P0 to Q1, P1, right? Uh, is given by, well, I should say it's generated by, right? Because it really is a generating function. Um, so minus P zero is DLD, the Q zero, Q zero, Q one, H, right? And then P one is equal to DLD, the Q one, Q zero, Q one. H. Okay, um, so um, so you can evaluate these things, okay, um, and you know it's really not all that different, right? Because uh, if you recall, Q zero and Q one are really just the um, control points, right? So Q zero corresponds to the Q zero zero control point. Uh, which corresponds to nu equals zero, and then Q1 uh, corresponds to the Q0s control point, which corresponds to this equation, but with nu equals to s. The only difference is that now the left-hand side is not zero, it's minus P0 or P1 respectively. Okay, so let's put all that together. Uh, what you get then is the following, uh, minus P0 is equal to sort of this, uh, right hand side for nu is equal to one, uh, zero, sorry. Right, so that's H uh, sum from I equals one to S of BI, DL, DQ, CIH, right? Uh, L tilde, nu is zero, okay, zero S, 
uh, ci plus 1 over h dl d q dot ci h right uh, l tilde dot uh, nu is 0 s ci Okay, so that's one equation, uh, and then you have sort of the internal equations, which are just written here. So zero is equal to h sum from i equals one to s of b i d l d q c i h l tilde nu s c i plus one over h d l d q dot c i h l tilde dot nu s c i. This is true for nu equals one to s minus one. And then there's the final one corresponding to this one, right, which is p one is equal to h sum from i x one to s of b i d l d q c i h l tilde uh, s s c i plus 1 over h uh, dl dq dot uh, ci h l tilde dot ss ci. Okay, all right, so hopefully you see the pattern. Okay, and so this system of equations, right, then defines for you that symplectic map. Okay, uh, so um, that's exactly what you need. Okay, so this is the discrete Hamiltonian map. This is the discrete Hamiltonian map. Which is uh, generated by the Galerkin discrete Lagrangian, right? So uh, if you prefer, it's like you could uh, have thought about this, uh, you know, Galician discrete Lagrangian as being um, something which uh, is uh, more like a multi-point discrete Lagrangian instead of just having the ones at the end points, you include the degrees of freedom uh, in the interior points as well. Uh, and, you know, there was a discussion about all these equivalent ways of thinking about composition methods. Uh, and, and so in principle, you could have, uh, if you preferred, you could have thought about this uh, as being a bunch of, uh, um, of points as well. Um, but at the end of the day, they are all equivalent. Uh, and, um, and so this is, again, one systematic way. It's like a very systematic way of constructing uh, variational integrators. Uh, and there was some more recent work, it's like by my former student James Hall and I, uh, where we basically show that um, you can um, relate the approximation properties of the Galerkin discrete Lagrangian um, to the uh, choice of function spaces and the quadrature rules which you use, which is again not so surprising. Uh, but in particular, the um, you know, it's like the property you want, it's like of the approximation spaces you choose um, is that um, <clears throat> they should have uh, some good best approximation error properties. And so if you can establish something about the rate at which some family of approximation spaces approximates uh, some bigger family of functions um, using what is called the best approximation error, if that best approximation error has a certain rate of decay as you add more and more terms, um, then your um, Galerkin discrete Lagrangians will inherit that kind of uh, error decay rate as you increase the number of terms. It's like in the uh, Galerkin discrete Lagrangian. So, so that gets really nice because it allows you to leverage uh, sort of um, results in approximation theory to then systematically choose what kind of approximation spaces you should be using uh, for the kind of prompts which you have in mind. Okay, so let me stop here and, and then we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit more later about um, what that, you know, to what extent this is related to uh, symplectic partition Runge-Kuhne methods. So let me stop for now.